external cleanliness is, is self-explanatory. And this pertains a lot to deity worship. The standard of cleanliness that we practice in our temples is not as high as it should be in general, but it is emphasized. Um, Prabhupada very much spoke about cleanliness. He said our temples should be revolutionary clean. Revolutionary means beyond the standard of normal cleanliness. Where there is, everything is nicely placed and arranged and there's not even a speck of dust to be found anywhere. That is uh, the standard for worshiping according to Pancharatri Vidi in the highest state of itself. Anything less than that is really not acceptable. Uh, growing up and living in Western society, our standards of cleanliness are quite low especially on an individual level. For instance, it's mentioned that if you are, if you are a brahmachari, then you should bathe at least twice a day. Grihastras are also mentioned that they have to bathe twice a day. Sannyasis, three times a day. Mm -hmm. So that's quite, uh, you might say it seems to be a lot, but that's the standard of Vaishnav culture where regular bath is there. We grow up in Western countries and these standards are not taught by the society nor by our, generally by our parents. Sometimes we don't even bathe once a day which is really below the standard. In the Bhagavatam, it says there is the principles of a human society. And one of the pen principles is that one should bathe at least twice a day. Mm -hmm. uh, one should keep clothes very clean and neat. And uh, one should always have fresh attire. Uh, cleanliness is in the mode of goodness. Dirtiness is in the mode of ignorance. Disorderliness is in also in the mode of passion and ignorance. Generally, what we see is that people who don't know how to practice cleanliness, what they do as they allow things to go down to a certain standard of dirtiness. And then when it reaches a certain part and it becomes intolerable or, or it's very much noticeable, then there is a effort to bring it back to cleanliness. And then because the standard of cleanliness is not taught as a principle, the same cycle continues. So what we have is dirtiness is the mode of ignorance. Cleanliness is the most of goodness. When things fall after a certain time, the mode of passion is used in order to bring it back to the mode of goodness. But the mode of passion is not the principle for operation. The mode of goodness is just like we see there are three deities, three main deities, Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva. Brahma is called the creator. And he is he he operates or is somewhat in charge of the mode of passion. Creation is in the mode of passion. Destruction is in the mode of ignorance. And that is controlled by Lord Shiva. And you see, maintenance is by Lord Vishnu. And he is in the mode of goodness. 
So when things go down too far, we use the mode of passion to overcome the mode of ignorance, to bring it back to the mode of goodness. But because the standard is not sta stable, it's a continuous cycle. The idea is to keep it in the mode of goodness through regular maintenance. So cleanliness has to be there. In the uh, Srimad Bhagavatam in the 12th canto, it's mentioned. Um, let's see. Uh, you want to turn to uh, Srimad Bhagavatam, 12th canto, Runda, 12th canto, third chapter, verse number 33, I believe it is. 3, 12, 3, 33. Avrata vavato shau cha viksava sya kutumbina tapasvino graham vasa nasino dvakta lo lupaha so this is this section is talking about the effects of the mode of the age of Kali. And here it gives some of the general effects. The brahmacharis will fail to execute their vows and become generally unclean. The householders will become beggars. The vanaprastas will live in the village. The sannyasis will become greedy for wealth. Purport. Brahmachari student life is practically non existence in the age of Kali. In America, many boys' schools have become co educational because young men frankly refuse to live without the constant companionship of lusty young girls. Also, we have personal, we have personally observed throughout the Western that students' residents are among the, we can't see the word. Amongst the dirtiest places on earth, as predicted here by the word Ao Sao Cha. Concerning householders, concerning householder beggars, when devotees of the Lord go to door to distribute transcendental literature and requesting donations for the propagation of God's glorious, irritated householders commonly reply, someone should give me a donation. Householders in Kali Yuga are not charitable. Instead, because of their miserly mentality, they become irritated when spiritual men mendicants approach them. In Vidikausra, at the age of 50, couples are retired to sacred places for austere life and spiritual perfection. In countries like America, however, retirement cities have been construction where elderly people can make fools of themselves by wasting the last years of their life playing golf, ping pong, and shuffleboard, and engaging in pathetic attempts at love affairs, even while their bodies are horribly rotting and their minds are growing senile. This shameless abuse of the venerable last years of life denotes a stubborn unwillingness to acknowledge the actual purpose of human life and is certainly an offense against God. The word nyasino tiarta lo lupa indicates that charismatic religious leaders and even those who are not charismatic will proclaim themselves prophets, saints, and incarnations to cheat the innocent public and fatten their bank accounts. Therefore, the International Society of Krishna Conscious is working arduous to establish bona fide celibate student, religious household life, dignified and progressive retirement, and general spiritual leadership for the entire world. Today, May 9th, 1987, in the central city of Rio, Rio, Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, we have awarded Sanyas the renounced order of life to three young men, two Brazilians and one American, with the sincere hope that they will faithfully execute rigid vows of renounced life and provide authentically spiritual leadership in South America. So here you see the, the Kali Yuga effects of the different ashrams. And the first one is mentioned, brahmacharis will keep, fail to keep their vows 
and become dirty. And those of you who are familiar with ashram life will understand this principle quite clearly. Whether you are a brahmachari or you used to live in the, uh, in the ashram or you are a lady and you also live in the ashram or have lived in the ashram, you notice that ashram life has a tendency to be very unclean. Why? There's no excuse. It's just the way it is. It's the effects of Kali Yuga. People are not trained in cleanliness. Prabhupada used to give some strong statements to us who are living in the temple. He said, if you if you don't know how to keep clean, go home and live with your mother and she will teach you. He also said brahmachari life means dirty. Many times Srila Prabhupada would go to different temples and inspect the different ashrams to see the standard of cleanliness. And he often would comment how the standard was very, very low or no standard at all. And so we might also say, well, what, how do we live at home? What is the standard of cleanliness that we keep within the house? It should be of the ideal. Cleanliness has a certain aura about it, which gives an, the element of spirituality a support. When something is untidy, uh, carelessly left or not clean in any sense of the word, one cannot really focus nicely to, to uh, execute one's devotional service. So out of the principles that make up Brahminical life, which are the qualities of the mode of goodness, uh, cleanliness is one of the highest standards. In other words, cleanliness and truthfulness stand out amongst all the qualities of Ruminical life. And that specifically applies to ashram life and even more so in the worship of the deity. Those who worship the deity at home must keep a very high standard of cleanliness. Wherever the deity, it should be, as Prabhupada said, revolutionary clean. You cannot find one speck of dirt anywhere. Um, I won't mention any names, but I know one particular leader in our society. He is somewhat famous for his standard of cleanliness in all levels, both individual and within his different yatras. And he will go to different places and he will go to uh, a room and take his finger and run it across the top of a window ledge. You know, that ledge that stands at the top of the window and see if there's any dust there. And if he finds dust, he will say, dirty. When Srila Prabhupada was in um, India one time, he uh, was giving a tour of one temple. Now this devotee, who was the temple president, was, to, uh, was showing Srila Prabhupada all the places in the temple. Now this is India, and Prabhupada was very much appreciating the standard of cleanliness. At one point, he came into one area, I believe it was in one corner of the room, there was some dirt. And Prabhupada immediately pointed it out and said, you know, get it clean. He said, the business of a temple president, he said, the main business of the temple president is to keep everything clean. So if we are at home, I know most of us who are listening to this, uh, this class today, don't live in the temple, we live in the homes. And sometimes we have children and we also have uh, a lot of things. <laughs> uh, having too many things or unnecessary things 
a lot of this comes with having children because children always like more and more stuff <laughs> and they pile up the home and the things get out of hand and become a little dirty and sometimes uh, find it very difficult to keep it clean. But this is one of the main duties of spiritual life because spiritual life it really means brahminical life and brahminical life cleanliness is the high one of the highest principles so uh, therefore and Prabhupada said our temples should be revolutionary clean when a new devotee would join the temple one of the first services not one of the first service the first services that devotee would get is they would give him the opportunity to clean the temple, sweeping it, washing it, and making it orderly, just to teach the principles of cleanliness. And this is very much necessary. Now, not only in Western countries, but all over the world, we find that the standard of cleanliness, both in the homes and in the uh, temples are sometimes quite far below what it should be. So when everything is neat and clean, everything has the element of goodness, which means one feels uh, peaceful in that environment. When things are not kept sloppily or unorderly, not put in a certain place. For instance, Srila Prabhupada, when he first started the movement, he didn't, uh, he would go from place to place. And uh, sometimes he would use a trunk, a metal trunk that he would carry his stuff in from India. And he would use that as the desk. And he would sit just at the base of the metal trunk. And on the metal trunk, he would keep all his necessary paraphernalia for doing his writing and working. And if someone came and cleaned the trunk and then put the stuff back, if it wasn't put exactly in the same place where it was, Prabhupada would make sure he rearranged it back and indicated this is where it goes. Now, Srila Prabhupada was so super uh, meticulous about cleanliness and orderliness that he would point this out many times to his devotees who had a hard time understanding the level of cleanliness that Prabhupada was trying to indicate. But this is spiritual life because dirtiness, sloppiness, unorderliness is all part of the material world and is of the lower modes of passion and ignorance. So Brahminical life is the mode of goodness and therefore cleanliness is a high principle. And therefore, one of the principles of execution of devotional service is Atyahara. Um, Atyahara is not a principle, it's not a positive principle, it's a negative principle. It's called too much eating and too much over collecting or over collecting. Too much eating or over collecting. When one collects more material things than they need, it becomes very hard to organize things. And at the same time, it also becomes an opportunity for things to get unclean. Mm -hmm. now, Prabhupada was very meticulous about that. If he saw a devotee sitting in class when he was giving class and that devotee would touch his face Prabhupada would say, wash your hands. Or, now this is one of the things that I know, that if a devotee is doing some kind of, like he's reading the Srimad Bhagavatam, or chanting rounds, or even worshiping the deity, if they somehow intermittently touch something that's unclean during this time, when Prabhupada was there, he would immediately say, wash your hands. You touch the floor, wash your hands. You're going to touch your bead bag again, wash your hands. You're going to pick up the book, wash your hands. <laughs> Prabhupada was very diligent to teach us the principles 
of precise cleanliness, which is verminical. It's one of the highest principles. And of course, uh, keeping nice, neat, and orderly clothes. Clothes should be kept clean, should be looked nice. When a devotee is dressed very nice, has very nice tea lock on. When um, their clothes are nice and orderly, and they look dressed nice, Prabhupada said, they look like they come from Vaikuta. <laughs> he said, they look like they come from Vaikuta. Now, this is a standard. Sometimes now in some of our temples, we uh, devotees come in with um, uh, ordinary clothes, sometimes blue jeans and whatever else they want to carry in. And it looks really quite dirty, sloppy, and somewhat disrespectful. If you're coming to the temple and you are, you are a devotee, in other words, you have been engaged in devotional service, you should always wear temple clothes, dhoti, sari for the ladies. The saris, the, the women look so beautiful when they have their very colorful saris on. I remember when I was, before I had joined the movement, I was in, uh, I was in Vietnam. And I noticed the culture in Vietnam that many of the ladies, in fact, all of the ladies, they look very, very beautiful in their, uh, their uh, traditional uh, dress. The ladies sometimes would carry umbrellas just as a decoration, and they wear very colorful clothes like that. You know, when you've been used to, now you see ladies, they wear jeans and they, they stuff their bodies and such in the jeans that the jeans are too small anyway. And it looks really gross and quite ugly. It's kind of disgusting. So nobody cares what they look like anymore. Where it says in the Shastras, it says, one, we eat to please ourselves. We dress to please others. This is a statement from Shastra. We eat to please ourselves. We dress to please others. We don't eat to please others. We don't dress simply to please ourselves because how you look really gives an indication of what you are about. That's why Prabhupada was very keen on making devotees sure that they always look nice by wearing devotional clothing, especially when we go to the temples. In the homes, of course, we may all wear, you know, nice, clean, ordinary clothing. But it's even nice to wear devotional clothes, even in the homes. It keeps us aware of who we are. Um, I slipped from that standard for a long time. And I was wearing, when I was in the house, I would wear just a pair of clean yogi pants. And uh, I thought by doing that, that would give me uh, less time to worry about washing and folding and ironing dhotis. But then again, I started to feel a little bit awkward in that. So then I changed and got away from that standard. So the idea is to you know, always be neat, clean, nice tea lock. Tea lock should look nice. Unfortunately, today my tea lock is not so nice because I was running to be here on time. Normally I would always check and see if my tea lock is looking nice. There was one devotee in our movement and she was a very elevated devotee. She would say, if I don't have tea lock on, I feel like I am naked. There's a feeling of that being, of being undressed without having Vaishnav tea lock on. And it's also very important. It make, well, makes one look like a spiritual person. <laughs> that we want to remind ourselves and also others. Sometimes devotees feel like, well, I'm out in public and people will not appreciate or think that I'm different or strange if I wear um, Vaishnav clothing, tilak, et cetera, Kunti Mala would, and also the men would have wear the, uh, the uh, Sika like that. But Prabhupada said, 
it, it is coming from Vaikuntha, it reminds one of the spiritual world. So cleanliness takes different uh, aspects of itself, how we dress, uh, the quality of the, the, the dress we wear and keeping everything very clean and orderly. And this is a challenge in Kali Yuga because in Kali Yuga, we, the tendency is to have too much stuff. Our homes, the closets are filled with junk <laughs> that we don't, you haven't used for the last 15 years, but it's still there for some reason. And then after five years, we go and check to see what's there. And then we have to do a fast cleanup, maybe throw out one or two things, and then we collect more st stuff. So this, this collecting stuff is really a, the business of um, an animal. An animal collects stuff and sometimes stores it away like a bear or a beaver or a dog like that. In Vedic culture, there was no such thing as refrigeration. It's interesting, refrigerators are part of today's modern society, even in old Europe, refrigerators weren't there. People would cook and use everything uh, that they made for that day, and then the next day they would start again. Sometimes there was a little bit of storage, but very little, but refrigeration was something, something now modern day thing. We open up the refrigerator and we open up the door and half the stuff falls out. It's been there for the last, you know, millennium. Um, refrigerators are jammed. <laughs> Unfortunately, because I go to people's homes and live there, sometimes I become overwhelmed with amazement by how much the refrigerators are stuck all the way up. Sometimes two, three, four refrigerators like that. And stuff that is never used is just stored. <laughs> so yeah, these are all principles of uh, Maya. Um, these are the lower modes of passion and ignorance. Therefore, the standard of cleanliness, orderness, and simplicity. This is also included in this discussion of simplicity. If we remain simple, we will always be able to use everything that we have and not collect more and more and more. Today's, today's society wants to sell you everything to make sure that you keep spending your money and find different ways. Therefore, the husband works, the wife works, the children even have to uh, struggle to maintain their own. Everybody works so because we have a certain standard of livelihood that is beyond what is actually needed. It's all part of the culture of buy, 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 use, 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 something new. I have a computer. I've had it for four or five years. It, I have to get another one. I have a car. I have to get another one. So this idea of keeping changing, 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 we also have that element. We've taken that change principle to relationships too. People find it very hard to stay in relationships. So they keep changing relationships also quite often. So that's, uh, that's a feature of the age of Kali. As we see from this verse, this verse is one of the verses which indicates what are some of the defects within the different ashrams in the age of Kali. So cleanliness, simplicity, and, uh, and the principles that govern these are the basis to a Brahminical life and Brahminical life is the foundation for spiritual execution. Like that. Okay, in the last one, the sannyasis will become greedy for wealth. Srila Prabhupada would sometimes say to the, the grihasas in our movement, if you need any money, go see the sannyasis. <laughs> they have all the money. <laughs> Unfortunately, it's still like that in today's society <laughs> for whatever reason. Anyway, sannyasis are not supposed to uh, keep money. They're supposed to use it in Krishna's service. 
like that and not collect. So these are some of the principles that make up devotional life like that. Okay, so I'll stop there and see if there's any questions related to the topics. Thank you, Maharaj, for a wonderful class on the cleanliness. Thank you so much. Request devotees if there are any questions, comments. Please go ahead. Hare Krishna Guru Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances, our glories to Srila Prabhupada and our glories to you. Uh, thank you very much for this interesting and, and very practical topic. Um, it just uh, came to my mind because now I'm, I'm currently sick. So uh, is it possible to maintain the same principles when someone has to lie in a bed almost all day? Or, so what, what can we do when we are sick? Uh, about cleanliness. Well, what we do when we are sick is do the needful. Therefore, do whatever is required in order to treat yourself. In other words, get back to normal health. That, re that becomes the, the foremost principle to, re to regain your, your normal health again. So whatever you may have to do in order to do that, that becomes a requirement. So you may find yourself not able to maintain the standard of livelihood that is done when you are you're more active and, and less, uh, less have to worry about your health. But I don't think there is a, uh, that one, if, if you're keeping this, this simple lifestyle when you're healthy, when even when you get sick, it won't be challenged so much. So do the, do the needful. Um, beds are considered to be unclean. So even while you're sick, make sure you always keep the bed very, very clean because bacteria will tend to accumulate during sicknesses. And therefore there should be a regular cleaning, changing of the linen within the bed, the sheets, the pillow cases, everything should be clean and like that. That will also aid in getting health back. And if we're not uh, aware of that, we might be finding ourselves uh, becoming more, staying sick because we're in an area that's not clean. Mm -hmm. So try to keep that. If, if health prevents you from taking regular bath, then you have to follow that, but still there has to be some hygiene on a daily basis, even while one is sick. Thank you very much. It, it was really useful because I, I was always confused what I was always confused what to do in, in this kind of situation. So so it's uh, very useful. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Rishabh uh, Das Prabhuji is asking a question. If you are using technology for preaching, is then okay to get one, uh, get new ones to ease our preaching? Well, not ease the preaching. That is not the right phraseology. It's that, um, well, the thing is, technology will always try to, society will always try to update your technology. Even while you have the technology you're using, you'll find that they're, they're always sending you messages for updates, new technology. I most of the time, like 100% of the time, I ignore all their requests. I find whatever I have is necessary for what I have to do. Like that. So preaching doesn't require all this new fancy stuff, whatever you have, you can do. My present computer is about 
seven or eight years old. And people are saying, well, you know, you know, some people think, well, that's, that's old, but I'll use the compu computer until the computer cannot be used anymore. And then I'll get another one, but it's not that I got to have the latest, you know, computers that have all the updates that they're sending and all this stuff. It's not necessary. You can still preach without all that. <laughs> Thank you, Maharaj. Uh, Maharaj, I have a question. Uh, so for our deities, uh, also we maintain the cleanliness, like we have a separate vessels, a plates for them, and we have a separate scrub for washing them, and we don't eat anything before offering them. So these, all these things, they look a little difficult for new people or for those who are not in ISKCON yet. And they think that this process is very difficult when we follow this. So what do we do about that? How can we? Yeah, uh, you, you, your volume cut out and I didn't catch oh. the question. Okay, sorry, Manaj, I will repeat it. Uh, so while maintaining the cleanliness uh, with respect to our deities, like we have separate plates for them, or we have a separate scrub for washing those vessels, or we don't eat anything before offering to them. So all these things, when a new person comes in and when they observe this, they think that this process is a little difficult to follow for them. Um, That's because they're new. And so, they, 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 should be, they, they should be trained also. You don't, just because they don't understand doesn't mean we, we lower the standard. We just teach them that this is, this hmm. is the way it should be done. That's all. Mm. But because this looks difficult to them, they try to go away a little bit from all this because they think they won't be able to do it. <laughs> well, we have to teach oh. them. That's all. Okay. This is the Lord. And therefore, when you're dealing with the Lord, everything has to be done in the best possible way, in the cleanest possible way. Mm. You have to emphasize that this, when you're dealing with the Supreme Lord, uh, this is the standard that should be maintained. You have to teach them that. You don't have to lower the standard because of, mm. of them. No. Mm. They have to come up to the standard night that you drop the standard down. Mm -hmm. mm. New people means training. New people means education. Thanks, Maharaj. Thank you, Maharaj. Mm. Uh, Shabdas is asking, eating only much as needed also helps to be clean, isn't it, Maharaj? Yeah, that's true. We, if we eat too much, we fall into the lower modes of passion. Yeah, that also helps to be clean. Yeah, that's part of internal cleanliness, which can also affect external cleanliness. Raj Prabhu, do you have a question? Please go ahead. Hare Krishna Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. All glory to Srila Prabhupada. All glory to you, Guru Maharaj. Hi. Well. Maharaj, it's, uh, we already have so much difficulty with uh, managing all our, our our work and household responsibilities and all of the problems that we have and managing it, trying to do as much bhakti and spiritual activities, etc. that we, we find that as many of us in our life certainly find it a struggle to try and balance everything and then to try and keep a high standard of cleanliness is is actually quite difficult, especially if you're in a in a home with where there's uh, like as soon as you've cleaned it, it's dirty again after five minutes because people have come around and 
do things. I, so it's not I, I think what, what I think is we I think we should get things up to a certain standard of cleanliness and then operate from that standard instead of you know letting our lifestyle destroy our standard work for a certain standard and when you get up to a certain standard when things are orderly and clean it's easier to get many more things done sometimes doing do do disorderly this we can't find things <laughs> we misplace things uh that wastes time anyway so work to get a certain standard and then work from that standard don't don't allow your work and your lifestyle to create the standard. You create the standard that fits according to your work and lifestyle. Okay, thank you, Maharaj. And the principle is, you know, cleanliness. Sim the principle is simplicity. Keep simple. <laughs> Thank you, Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Anyone else has any questions or any reflection? Okay. Um, Milan is asking, uh, is Western clothes have impacts to our consciousness? Well, we're men, I mean, we may find the use of Western clothes, you know, practical in some parts of our day. I'm, I'm emphasizing that when we come to the temples, as devotees, we should dress in Vaishnav clothes. Coming before the deity, particularly if we are initiated, these are, I think, requirements and standards that we should very much follow. It looks nice. It reminds us of who we are. It fits within the decorum of the temple. All these things are important. Why did Prabhupada introduce this? Of course, you can become Krishna conscious anyway, in any way you dress, but there is an etiquette that we follow and one of the etiquettes for temple life is proper dressing and proper activity in the temple. So I'm not pushing that point for when you're living at home, you may, you know, find yourself using whatever dress you want when you live within the home or you're going out. But everything should be neat and clean, no matter what standard of dress you adopt. But particularly in the temples, I would say that we should follow that standard very strictly. That we wear Vaishnav clothes in the temples. I know people who are averse to the whole idea of Vaishnav clothes. In other words, they don't wear it at all because they think it looks too strange. They don't feel comfortable in it. There's so much conditioned by Western society, they don't see the benefit of it. These are devotees, many of them are initiated too. But this is not the standard Prabhupada set and many of the leaders who follow Prabhupada also preach in the same way. That we, in the temples, we should keep that standard of uh, Vaishnav clothing. At home, you may, you may be a little bit lax or a little bit different and of course, for preaching, sometimes we would, in order to address a particular audience, we may change our dress in order to, uh, you know, be able to relate to that audience more. That is also allowable and permissible. That is, that is for preaching, changing our dress according to time, place, and circumstance in order to make it more easily for people to accept the message. But in general, you know, if we're not, uh, what we say, averse to this 
It's not Indian dress. This, these dress that people think, well, this is Indian. It's not Indian. Yeah. You can read the Bhagavatam. It says in the Bhagavatam how people dress in the spiritual world. These are these are these are the dress of the of the of, the, of spiritual people, not just. It just happens that Indian culture also adopted this because Indian culture is a very spiritual culture in essence. But it's not an Indian thing. It's a spiritual thing to dress. Mm -hmm. Rajprabhu, do you have another question? Please go ahead. Yes, thank you. Uh, Maharaj, at the beginning of the class, you talked about we should have develop our uh, mm -hmm. internal cleanliness as well as uh, external. But when I think like there are so many qualities that I need to develop, is there any quality uh, that is like key or more important that we should really try and work on? Well, you mean internal? Yes. Well, Prabhupada says by chanting the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra, we are actually uh, developing internal cleanliness. But the, the characteristics of the mode of goodness are conducive to the execution of devotional service, such as humility, tolerance, patience, pridelessness, uh, simplicity, uh, peacefulness, cleanliness, truthfulness. All of these are important. And these are the qualities of goodness. Okay. Is any of them like, if, if I were to like tap into one of them, because it's difficult to focus on all of them, or start with one of them, is there any one that you would recommend? Well, if you, by going to Shastra, you'll find that from the Brahminical point of view, truthfulness and cleanliness are the two outstanding qualities of Brahminical life. In spiritual life, in the 13th chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna mentions the 12 items of knowledge, um, amanitam, ahambitam, ahimsam, arjavam, like that. The 20 items of knowledge and then the first in the first one he talks about humility so lord chaitanya in his first turn out a piece of each ena tayori vasahishnuna amani namamadena kirtani asadadahi he emphasizes these four characteristics of a vaishnava humility tolerance uh, pridelessness and respect for others. So if we're practicing this third verse of Shikshastakam, we actually understand what is uh, the execution of devotional service. Because that verse allows one to approach the holy name easily and readily. Sorry, Maharaj, I was, I was trying to write that down. Humility, tolerance, just look up the prayers, the Shikshastakam prayers by Lord Chaitanya. Okay. Yeah, and that is verse number three, humility, tolerance, pridelessness, which is somewhat similar to humility. Uh, uh, what it means is not wanting respect for oneself and wanting to give respect to others. Now that's that can be giving respect to others. We find devotees don't have problems with that. Devotees generally can follow that principle quite nice. We give respect to others, but when we when it comes to not wanting respect for ourselves, that's a little more difficult because we think, oh, I'm giving respect. I should also get respect. The Lord Chaitanya said no. We shouldn't be eager for that. Okay, thank you very much, Mahaj. And that's that's the quality of pridelessness.
If someone gives respect, that's fine, but we should not be eager for it. Thank you. That's helpful. Thank you. Do you have a question? Please go ahead. Uh, thank you, Mataji. Um, Hare Krishna, Dhan Pranam, Guru Maharaj. Thank you so much for the very nice class. Uh, please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. All glories to you, uh, Guru Maharaj. Thank you, Maharaj. Maharaj, uh, Guru Maharaj, I have a question about like uh, uh, neophyte devotees who are practicing devotional service. Uh, so how will they know like uh, when they are ready for to have a deities at home? Like um, then they, they should, they should, they should ask their spiritual master. Oh. It's not, it's not a decision that should be made independently. One should, uh, one should ask the spiritual master or someone who one has taken guidance from, for permission to begin worshiping the deity at home. And then. That can be judged from there. Okay. Okay, Maharaj. So, uh, general standards also we should have, right? The cleanliness and uh, all those things. Yeah. Yeah, they're they're not optional. They're mandatory. Okay. When it comes to deity worship, there are two principles. Cleanliness and punctuality. Mm. And there's a third principle, which is called simplicity, mm. which is the foundation for maintaining cleanliness and punctuality. If one is doing worship and cannot maintain the cleanliness because of worship, then one should uh, standardize the worship where, the, where cleanliness can be easily maintained. Thank you, so much. Thank you so much. I just have one more question, Guru Maharaj, about like internal cleanliness and external cleanliness. Uh, so these regulative principles like uh, doing uh, Mangalarti in the morning. So in which category they fall under? Like uh, yeah, that's internal cleanliness. Oh, internal cleanliness. Okay. Okay. Yeah, anything uh, spiritual, uh, any any of any of the sadhana. The sadhana mm -hmm. is our morning program, or any all of that falls into internal cleanliness. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. Uh, Maharaj, uh, my question is about the change uh, in life, what you, are talk you, what you were talking about. Some people, uh, you know, they have the habit of, uh, they like, as you said, they change their car um, uh, after some years. Then uh, I know some people who, who have... Uh, such mentality that uh, they don't buy their uh, house they keep it on uh, they keep a rented house just because they they like the change in life uh, so they keep you know uh, migrating so is this a good mentality the change they say that um, you know you have you should have some newness in life is this a good quality I mean not at all it's not a good quality. <laughs> it's, it's the idea of renting means throw, taking money and throwing it away. That's all it is. <laughs> it's the same thing as wasting money. When you're done, you have actually absolutely nothing. Hmm. But the best thing is to purchase your own property and then maintain it. 
and then build on it. And then you have something. From the practical point of view, it's, it's actually even better. So you have a nomadic type of society where people want to keep changing from place to place mm -hmm. because they're not satisfied where they are. It's the, it's, the, it's the Western disease, change for the sake of change. Prabhupada mm -hmm. talks about this a lot, and that even when it comes to livelihood, people would live in the same area and work in the same area that they live. And there was no need to spend so much time going from place to place just for livelihood. When you have your own place, you have something. When you rent, you have absolutely nothing. <laughs> and sometimes if you add it up over the years, if you continue renting, you find that the money you spent on rent at that at one point you could have bought a house with that same amount of money. Right. Yeah, so but uh, we, we, we live in a dis dysfunctional society. Our society is dysfunctional. And in order to to live within that society, we also have to uh, what we say acquiesce or accommodate our life according to that society. Like I know one person, they pay like extraordinary amounts of rent each month, but their the, the job that they have warrants that they have to be in that area. And so in order to maintain that particular lifestyle job, they sacrifice. But in the long run, you have nothing. Mm -hmm. So uh, you're dealing with a lose-lose situation <laughs> because ultimately, if you want to live according to the ideal lifestyle, you have to live in a more simplified environment and you should live in community. For those who are married, community, grihasta life means community, society not living in this is of course now we have a compromised lifestyle being thrown into these cities but Prabhupada said these cities are artificial the lifestyle is artificial it destroys the good qualities of the living beings like that going from place to place is just it's just restlessness that's all Okay, Maharaj, thank you. That answers, Maharaj. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Evo. Anyone else has any questions or anything to share? Please go ahead. Uh, Hare Krishna, Guru Maharaj. Uh, please accept my humble obeisances. August to Prabhupada and August to you. Maharaj, I just want to double check if my understanding is correct or not. So is it like the external cleanliness is dependent on the internal cleanliness that the more I am clean from inside is going to reflect my exterior? Is it a proper understanding? Uh, well... External cleanliness and internal cleanliness are somewhat complementary each other because internal cleanliness raises our consciousness to the higher standards of the mode of goodness, which reflect, which will naturally reflect our external environment. Yeah, so it is, it is, if you are, if your consciousness is dirty, you also will reflect that externally. If your consciousness is clean, you'll also reflect that externally. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's not that if, because sometimes we enter the house of a person who is not uh, uh, chanting Hare Krishna, but their house looks pick and span, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they're internally clean. The question is coming from that basis. Yeah, that's, that's, oh, okay. 
Well, that, you know, you might say that's a good quality in a material sense. But the real, the real cleanliness is the internal cleanliness. The external is an extension of that. They may have this understanding of the importance of cleanliness, but some materialistic people are like that. They're very super clean. And that's, that we can say is a good quality materially. But when devotees are clean uh, externally, it's not a material quality, it's a spiritual quality. It's a reflection of their internal cleanliness. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. So now I'm interested. I'm going to go back and open the 17th chapter where Bhagavad Gita, where Krishna talks about internal and external. Generally, my realization is when we read the scriptures, there is a, there is a, uh, it's like the highest is the first. So I want to know what Krishna wrote first. Is it the internal or the external? Well, the highest is the first. What, is that what you said? Uh, yeah, it, the, generally when I read Bhagavad Gita, my my understanding or realization is that it's always from the first is the highest. For example, in 12th chapter when Krishna speaks about Ananya Bhakti and then he goes to Dhyana, Jnana. So highest first. So I'm, I'm just curious. It's, um, I'm very yeah, happy. Yeah, well, you, you see that in the, in the 12th chapter also of Bhagavad Gita, Krishna gives you the highest standard, but then he says, if you can't do this, then do this. And if you can't do this, then do this. And he go, he, he go, keeps going down to a lower standard. What he's saying is actually do something. Yes. So here, is the, here is the ideal. Okay. Thank you. Know, you, like, you know, we are offering the ideal in everything we present. But we also know people are not up to that standard. So then we also teach them the process to move forward from wherever they are to a higher stage of, of activity, both internally and externally. You have to show the goal. If there's no goal, then people don't know what to aspire for. And then they will accept whatever goal that they want to make. So the goal has to be presented. Ananya Bhakti is the goal. Got it. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. It's very nice. Thank you. Thank you, Krishna. Thank you, Maharaj. That was a nice question answer session. Okay. Thank you. And so, well, uh, tomorrow is, uh, at least where I am, tomorrow is Ekadasi. So, we'll see everyone tomorrow at the same time. Thank you, Gurmaj. Hi, Krishna. Hari Bhav Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Hari Maharaj Ki Jai. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna Guru Maharaj, thank you. Hare Krishna Guru Maharaj. Hare Krishna Guru Maharaj. Anybody does not sure know who Sukhava is, she used to be Dipti, but something happened just recently. So now she's Sukhava. It's your mercy Guru Maharaj. It's mercy, but it's coming from Srila Prabhupada. <laughs> Thank you, Guru Maharaj. <laughs> Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Krishna, thank you, devotees, for joining. Hare Deva, some internet issue. Hare Krishna.